It's a very warm welcome to the Global Sports Channel today to Liz McCoglin. Liz, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Whereabouts in the world are you talking to us from today? Well, happy to, to be on the show. I'm uh, in Doha. I've been in Doha for um, seven years. Um, so, you know, quite enjoying a, a different lifestyle and um Obviously, very involved in athletics still because um, I have a do athletic club which I started uh, six years ago. So we have a lot of work that we do with expat children and Qatari children, just in the development of athletics here in Doha. Fantastic! And I would dare say that the weather is a little bit warmer than Bonnie Old Scotland. Yeah, it's like oh, it's really humid, and I think we've been saying for the last month, you know, the humidity is going to break, but we're it's still hanging in there, so um, we're still reaching, you know, temperatures like, um, you know, 40 degrees, and humidity is still getting up quite high, sort of 70% and things, but seemingly in the next couple of weeks, um, as the, everybody keeps saying, it will break, and then we do, <laughs> do get some really nice weather, sort of like December, January, and you know, if you're an outdoors type like me who likes running outdoors, and that's actually really pleasant. So, um, so soon, soon it will be changed. You li- you've lived in various places around the world. Is it uh, one of the hottest places you lived in Doha? Oh, definitely. Well, I mean, I lived in Florida for ten years. Um, as an elite athlete, I had uh, a training base in Gainesville, Florida. So I'm used to the heat and humidity, and I actually quite like it. You know, I, I um. You know, it's a tight, I'd rather have it that way than the snow and the rain and the sleet in Scotland. Um, so, you know, I think I'm a bit spoiled now. Um, I think I'd really struggle to go back in the winter and back home. But, um, you know, it's always quite suited me in the warmer climates. And um, as I say, I've always trained, even as a young, you know, when I was a, a younger athlete, um, really enjoyed those hot, humid conditions and ran well in hot and humid conditions. So it seems to suit me very well. Hmm. Quite ironic, though, isn't it, when you're coming from an, an upbringing and background as you have in Scotland to be a good performer in those temperatures. We see it in many competitions across the world where athletes are, are competing in, in conditions against their normal habitat and they tend to fall over and not be too well in those conditions. But you're the opposite, aren't you? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I always took the, you know, obviously I'm an endurance runner and um I always took, you know, whenever there was uh, championships like Olympics or um, World Championships, um, they were always held in warmer climates. So, you know, I would always take myself off to try and prepare as best as what I could. Um, even when I was training in Scotland, um, I, you know, I would be training in a, a little room that had like a treadmill and a sauna in it so that I would be recreating you know, humidity. So, um, you know, it's, it's always been a really big, important part of my training, not you know, not so much altitude training, which a lot of endurance runners tend to go altitude. I was always one that went for really hot and humid. Um, you know, I believe back in the day when I was running that it stressed my body as much as what altitude training did, and it worked for me. So um, and I had some great results from running in the heat. So, um, so yeah, I think it's you know swings and roundabouts as to you find what works for you and what you're happy and balanced at doing. And for me, you know, I really did like running in the heat and humidity i just like the the challenge that it set for, for the type of training that i used to do which was a lot of really high miles and a lot of really really hard work but um you know the body was really stressed the hilt when i was training in florida you know i'd be training at sort of 90 degrees where you know 100 percent humidity sometimes and it would just be you know really really stressful but um as i say you know i i did it for a reason so that i could be fit and healthy when we went to championships to mm. deal with the heat whatever yeah. there yeah great now one of the things that i do on my show is i always offer the guests the opportunity to dedicate their show to someone special in their life so who would you like to dedicate your show to today um probably my parents really because well my, my dad passed on several years ago and my mum um is, is still alive and i think that you know without my parents and my family support um you know i i wouldn't be the person i am today but um and also another person that um passed on um when i was really young was my coach called harry bennett who was the guy that really um made me i I coach nowadays and all my coaching ethos comes from what he taught me when Mm. i was like you know from the age of 12 to um uh, 17 and he died he, he actually died uh, out running when I was 17 and you know I went on to do a lot of other things but it was all due to his 
putting like a little spark in my head about how good I could be and what I could achieve. So really just my parents and Harry Bennett, really. Fantastic. Lovely dedication. So thank you for, for doing that. I want to take you back to your younger days, actually, because there was a PE teacher at your school that saw something special in you, somebody that didn't want to quit. And as you've said a number of times, you're not somebody that had that absolute natural talent to start off with, but you were somebody that was never going to give up. Tell us about that relationship you had with the PE teacher. Yeah, um, I was I was at a school that wasn't very supportive of the children that were there, and I know that a lot of people say that their school days were the best days of their lives, but mine certainly wasn't. I had a really tough time at school. Um, you know, we, we came from a council estate, and a lot of the teachers at the school kind of just wrote you off and didn't really bother with you. Um, so, you know, I was the type of kid that was kind of ignored. Um, you know, I was very badly bullied at school, and I kind of just kept myself to myself and. You know, my saving grace was, I, you know, I, I love sport. And unfortunately, because, uh, you know, my mum and dad were pretty much unemployed most of my childhood, and um, we couldn't really afford to do anything. So, you know, I was always active at the, you know, the school activity clubs at lunchtime. Mm-hmm. And so I would go to, like, you know, um, volleyball, hockey, gymnastics, whatever was available. And obviously, the PE teacher who was a runner, he was a, a keen marathon runner, um, he, he obviously saw that, you know, although I wasn't like um, the ilk of a great athlete, um, I was quite a stubborn kid. Like if I couldn't do something, you know, I, I wouldn't give up until I was able to do it. And, you know, uh, he kind of saw that in me. And um, so he encouraged us to do cross country running at, at the school. And, um, you know, I was one of these kids that um, would never stop. I would just you know, if he told us to run to a certain loop, I would do it. I wouldn't walk or anything. And so he just said that he thought it was a good idea if I went along to his friend, who was Harry Bennett, mm-hmm. and he was the, the the local club, which was Dundee Hockley Harriers. And um, so I went along there. He sent four of the children from the school along. And it was good for us because um, at the time we didn't have any fees or anything to pay. So I was able to join. And um, Harry then just really took us, you know, under his wing. And out of the four children that went, I was the only one that actually stuck at it. And um, it was just something that really appealed to me. Um, it was a very individual sport back then. And, you know, I used to run down the club and run back from the club. And um, for the type of child that I was, um, it really suited my whole demeanour, really. Um, and it gave me a kind of an outlet that I didn't get at home. Yeah. Um, just to do things, and um, so really, it was a you know he he was a you know he, he was very good in directing um, on you know connecting me with his friend that was at the local club, and you know I I joined the local club right away when I was twelve, mm-hmm. and uh, you know and I I kind of I was put into sprinting which I wasn't any good at, and then they discovered me being an endurance runner by doing a charity run. Right. We did a charity club and um we were doing laps and the sprinters couldn't do laps and I was doing everybody else's laps and then Harry just said to me well you know you're an endurance runner and so he moved me into the road running section which was a bunch of older men really and I was <laughs> kind of like we're a bunch of older people but um you know I really thrived on it and um you know sort of the rest of the sister really you know I just worked really really hard and um, when I was about 16, Harry came to me and said, like, um, you have to stop all your school sports and all your other activities. And if you stop all that, um, you know, I'll come and train with you extra days in the week. And um, he, he was saying that, you know, I could be really, really good if I train harder. And, yeah. um, you know, without without uh, even asking, I just dropped everything and just totally went into running when I was 16. And then um, just, you know, sort of uh, trained... He trained me sort of twice a day, um, five days a week, and then um, I got third in Britain at 800 metres, and I got recruited to school in the states. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I when I went to, I wasn't going to go there, but Harry actually paid for my flight and everything to go. And so when I just before my 18th birthday, um, I flew off to Rexburg, Idaho, mm-hmm. um, and went to a junior college there and won all national titles there. And then a year later, got recruited from University of Alabama was there for three years so you know there's two guys that really were instrumental in me from being a, a 12 year old you know council estate kid that wasn't really outstanding and to developing a sort of one of the world's top distance runners and um you know it was a journey without those two guys 
picked up noticing something and mentoring me, um, it would never have been achievable, to be honest. Do you believe in the fact that I, I read a lot about, you know, great athletes of uh, many different generations and there's a common theme and that common theme is a lot of them have come from hardship and from very humble um, beginnings. Would you believe that that is a constant as well across a lot, all the amazing people you met on your journey? Um, I don't think you have to come from, um, you know, a, a, a hard hardened background but I think if you've if you've had um you, you know if you've if you've had a little bit of like you know a harder background to come through like whether you you know council estate kid or not um I think you, you just have to work that little bit harder to actually achieve you, you have to open doors a little bit more than those that are maybe and you know a bit more affluent than what you were um and I think too that you know especially for back then when I was running there women weren't making a living from athletics hmm. um you know it wasn't a big you know there weren't a lot of like role models that you could stand up and say oh you know i wish i was like dean asser smith or um you know apollo radcliffe and actually make a living out of it because it didn't really exist back in the days when i was running when hmm. i was a child hmm. um so i'm very aware of any other you know really good role models that you look up to and say you oh, wow i want to be like them so hmm. you know wasn't like it wasn't um making a career path to be a professional athlete it was just engaging in an activity that gave me a bit of um uh, a freedom of and i suppose a bit of control um over the lifestyle that i was actually in to sort of leave behind like i mean i would never have got an education at, if it wasn't for my running to go to the university of alabama and whatever um, you know, I, I just wouldn't have been able to achieve what I did if I hadn't been for my running. So, um, you know, it just gave me a different outlet that um, that I was really engaged in from a very, very young age. Was there anybody in the running world back in the day when you started off that inspired you? Was there a kind of a uh, inspirational icon in the athletic world at that time for you? Um, was, like when I was young, I didn't have a television, so you know, I wasn't I wasn't uh, aware of Olympic games and you know things like that and it wasn't until really I got into my running myself about 16, 17 and there was this sort of you know the Seb and Steve Ovet drama you know like sort of rivalry started and uh, for me I always looked at Steve Ovet because I always seen him as a like more on my part of town and I, I sort of could relate more to him and the type of runner that he was so um, I really kind of uh, admired him when I was like, you know, sort of 17, 18. Mm. And then when I sort of got really into my 10K running, um, there was a girl called Greta Weitz who, yep. Yep. Uh, you know, I then realised, you know, she was the the lady who really took women's distance running to the fore. You know, she won New York like eight times. She, you know, had records. Um, you, you know, she was like running world-class times way quicker than anyone before her and um, so she was quite inspirational and again you know from a, a very working class background um, you, you know from a, a background where you know she was the only girl in a family and you know as a girl she wasn't really deemed to be okay to run um, mm. so she struck a lot of cause me as well and I was very lucky enough to actually meet her towards the end of my career and she became my coach which mm. was a bit weird and wonderful but um <laughs> but yeah i would say that, that was the two sort of guiding my towards you know as i got into my athletics but as a sort of 12 13 14 year old i didn't really look up to athletics because i didn't really know anything about the sport because there was no role models there hmm. what about when you got on that plane to go to the u.s for the first time um let's talk about self-belief was, was it a nerve-wracking time for you thinking wow what am i doing this is a massive step leaving home leaving the country and putting all my eggs in this basket yeah i really didn't want to go and i was actually forced um you know i when i got the first phone call i just put the phone down on the guy and i don't know how he got my coach's number but he then called harry and harry went behind my back and met up with my mum and dad and said, you know, if they don't support this move, um, you know, if you know, if, if her running can take her to see other parts of the world, you need to, you know, enforce it. And um, as I say, like, you know, we couldn't afford the flights and things like that. And so 
Harry actually paid the flights out of his own money, and um, I was more or less frog marched down to London and put on a flight. <laughs> Not for he actually forced me I, I really, really didn't want to do. But, um, you know, obviously in hindsight, it was the best decision that they could have made for me. Um, and, you know, I, I went and I made friends really quickly and settled down. And, you know, it was hard the first three months because I'd never been, you know, away from my family and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I had my running and I really settled down to that lifestyle of being able to run twice a day and getting, you know, um, training shoes and getting running gear and you know uh, getting a lot of support able to go to a gym and you know things that I'd never done before that just um you know I, I really embraced it and um I thrived on it and it was a really really good decision for to enforce you know force me to go to it like as we know that self-belief in an athlete is absolutely critical when did it come to the stage where you kind of sat down with yourself and said I really can do something with this I can really be one of the best um, I never, I never ever thought that I, I was um, the best athlete. What I, what I always believed, like, you know, I used to train really, really hard, and when you train as hard as what I did, you know, your sessions don't lie. So my confidence came from um, sessions that I actually pushed myself to do. Mm -hmm. um, when I got to that stage where. I was running amazing sessions, my confidence grew. And then obviously because of the way I was training, I then became, you know, a very tough athlete to beat. And I, I started getting good results. And so my confidence came from the results in the running and the training. It wasn't from, um, you know, I, I, I would say that I was always quite um, uh, a disbeliever in, on at the very, very start on just how, you know, I never thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd ever get to the Olympics or be on a British team or whatever. Um, you know, it wasn't until I started doing really, really amazing things in my running, and I, I firmly believed at one stage in my career that there was no woman training as hard as me in the world, and mm. I, I really did get a lot of confidence from it. Well, was there a time where you recognised a real leap ahead in your training? Was it was there a change in your training regime per se, or was it just over time that you became you know stronger and faster? It was just over time. You know, I I, I had very consistent training, and I I trained more and more and harder and harder, and you know, learned the event a lot better as well through mistakes that I had done, um, and you know, I kind of got a, a good grasp on what I needed to do to be successful in 10k running mm. and marathon running and mm. um, you know I, I, I coached myself um, so you know it was a real learning experience but um, it took me several years to sort of work out what was good for me and what was bad for me and then once I sort of got on top of that um, it was just really consistency you know I, I just trained consistently hard and um, got some decent results out of it. Mm. You talk about visualization quite a lot. When did that actually come into your your life when it comes to training? Was that at a young age? Yeah, I've did it all my life because, like, obviously, I, I um, um, when I was younger, you know, just from the lifestyle that we had when I was young, I used to visualize a lot of things. Um, you know, the circumstances that we were in and things. So I've always done it very naturally, um, like a protective mechanism thing. And um, and like when I got into running, um, I'd always I'd always sort of rehearse things in my head. I've I've always been quite a visual person rather than a logical person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, as I went on in my training and things, you know, I kind of elaborated more in the way that I used to um, process things, uh, like you know, strategies of races and how I was going to race and how I relaxed when I was running and things. And I think that's why running suits me so much because when I run, you know, I don't listen to music. I never have listened to music. You know, I listen to my heartbeat and I listen to my body. Sort of, you know, um, sort of talked within myself to relax myself when I'm running. And so I've always done that. And I think that's why I love running, you know, and I've always loved running because it enables me to do that. And it's something that I've always done very naturally. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it was 
Bill, I met a guy called Jack Black. He called me up one day and uh, he wrote a book called Mind Store. And he says, oh, I've got this great technique for you. You know, I'd love to come and share it with you and, you know, help you win that gold medal sort of thing. And when he came to the house, he was like, you know, I can't believe that you're doing this already. You know, you've never been taught. <laughs> right. That. But what you, what you, the, the beauty of actually meeting Jack that sort of time was, he actually enabled me to um, hone it in better for to make it you know better for me for my preparation because you know obviously I was doing it naturally and maybe not grasping quite how strongly it would affect you know help me and um, mm -hmm. but we had good conversations about you know how to just maybe elaborate on certain things that I did and whatever but um, I think visualization is a a great the, the brain is a great tool you yeah. know as a computer. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool to unlock if you're able to do it. One of the things that you didn't do was allow your competitors to get into your head. You uh, had a glass bell over top of you most of the time, figuratively speaking. Tell us about that because I find that to be extraordinary. No, it's very difficult when you're a top athlete because, um, you know, when you go to a championship and whatever, you do your warm-up and then about 20, well, 20 to 30 minutes before your, well, 30, no, it's not about 40 minutes, your actual race you get called into a cold room where you know you've got to leave your coach and all that sort of stuff when your team and you you get marched into this room and they check your spikes and your numbers and da 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 and all your competitors are just sitting there and it's like you know you can get put off right away just from someone's demeanor in the room hmm. so I never like I never used to let anyone um sort of create any negativity about me because you know, I like you'd go into a race and you'd see someone, I don't know, like Inger Christensen or um, Alana Myers or Lynn Jennings or something like that. And, you know, you go in and you'd be very positive, and then all of a sudden you'd be thinking, oh, my days, like, you know, she looks really good. You know, look at her spikes. Her spikes are like really, you know, better spikes than my spikes. And, and you know, <laughs> like little negativity things come in and they actually take away from your thought process of what you're actually going to be to do so i used to i used to just go in like and you know I, I i just used to describe it as like putting like as soon as i went in the room it was like i just had a you know a glass bell on my head and people could speak to me and i just wouldn't even hear them and you know i wouldn't even look at someone um i was just so focused on what i had to do that i wouldn't let anything distract me at all no matter who they were or what they were yeah. and um so that was kind of my sort of uh, mechanism to sort of try and, you know, keep myself focused on what I had to do rather than focus on a person or the favourite or the non-favourite or whatever when you were called into these rooms. So on the flip side of that, when you became successful, did you use that as a weapon against your competitors when you're in the core room? Did you did you strut your stuff to say, hey, I'm, I'm here, I've, I've done well recently and try to put the fear of God into your competitors? Um, I think like um, it's like when you like you know I, I was sort of top of my game for sort of like four to six years. You know I had a great spell where um, you know I pretty much won the races that I went into. So you do create a bit of an uh, an aura about you, so that when you walk into the room, people look up to you and go, "Oh, there's Liz." So mm. you know, and and you know, you you do create that. And I think in every sort of top athlete has that sort of um, you know time when when they are the best in the world, or you know whatever that they they do create that, and you do you know you do feel you're invincible, and you know and and the way you carry yourself also states that as well and um you know it's not an arrogance or anything it's just the fact that you know you are on top of your game and you know you're the one that everybody's got to beat mm. and uh, and i think that you know um you know for several years there there was that type of thing when i walked into a room it was kind of like oh you know there's liz she's the one that you've got to beat and um you know it, it, again it didn't really i i never um, you know, I would never let anything like that affect me because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you were there to win a race and, you know, you, you know, everyone in that room was your rival. And um, and so I, I never actually rested on the laurels of the fact that, you know, I was the one that, you know, everyone else thought they had to beat because at the end of the day, whatever race I went to, I knew that they were out to beat me. And, mm. you know, 
Um, I just had to run and perform to the best that I could um, when I was on that start line healthy. Now, a lot of people would recognise the fact of, you know, you had a lot of great success, but there was a lot of times where things didn't go right. You didn't win a race. You, you didn't feel good on the day or something happened. We're living in a world today that has a lot of adversity and a lot of people struggling with different things. So what's your kind of advice? How did you deal with adversity back in the day when things didn't go right for you on race day? I think I had more disappointments than than wins, to be honest. Um, you know, that that's that's the the way the, the ball rolls with sport. You know, there's no guarantee, even though you, you go and you have the best preparation ever, there's never a guarantee that that race is going to go the way that you want it to go because at the end of the day, you need a lady luck on your side or whatever side of the bed you get out in the morning. You know, you need that something else that guides you to be the winner. You know, it's not all about just because you've had great training sessions and um, preparations being 100% right going in that you've got the guarantee that you're going to win that medal because it doesn't happen that way. So for me, you know, I, I always went in to give it, you know, um, to race the best I could. And when that didn't happen, um, I always, you know, I've always been on the, the mindset, whether you run the best race ever or the worst race ever, you always learn from it to make you... A better performance the next time because that's what running is and racing it's about performance and it's about you gaining to be the best performer that you can be and so even when you run bad and and have a disaster you know you've got to look back on the race analyze it and say well you know where did it go wrong what could it do how could it be better but even when you've had the best race ever the same process happens with me you know mm. i look over the race and I analyze it and i say well do you know what what was the good part and you know where could it have been better because there's always you know that's the basin and you know you, you always have a bit that you've got to improve and um so i i never dwelled on like when i lost a race i'd be upset and whatever but i was never the type of person that would spit the dummy out or throw the spikes down and get angry because i'd always be like well you know how can i make it better and hmm. always try to take positive out of a negative um because you beat yourself up <laughs> anyway. You know you, you know when you're unwell and you don't need the BBC commentators to tell you that you've run bad. You know, you, you, an athlete knows themselves. But, you know, I think that, you know, for to sort of survive and move on and get the best results out of it, you've just got to analyse it in a, in a proper analytical way that, you know, makes you take something away from it that's a positive. And, you know, and that's what I've always said, even even today when I've got my athletes that I coach, I always say to them, like, you know, even if you've had a good or a bad day, always look at it, you know, a day later and say, well, you know, what could I take from that performance to make me better? Liz, I've got to tell you, for us uh, weekend warriors out here, when we have a bad run, we always blame it on the chocolate cake we had the night before. <laughs> <laughs> so what about... What about when you had a fantastic run and you you won a medal or you broke a world record? Did you did you actually sit down and reflect on that as well about what went right during those fantastic times? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I didn't do was celebrate my success, which I regret now. Um, you know, I I was always like even when I ran exceptionally well, like when I won world titles, when I got BBC Sports Personality of the Year, I never actually took the time to go and celebrate those. Um, I was always up training the next day, getting ready for the next race. You know, how can it be better? How can I? And I think it's a really bad trait of mine that um, that I never really took my foot off the pedal. Um, and I always say, especially you know, to the athletes that I coach now, you know, whenever you're successful, always you know, take a breath, enjoy the moment, you know, celebrate it, and then get back into it. You know, because um, mm. I missed so many great opportunities. Well, I I, I missed great celebrations of. The achievements that I did um, and I did miss out on on that um, but you know again th that's me I'm quite a, you know I'm probably an over focused kind of person um, and, and um, so you know I, my, my biggest sort of regret in life is the fact that I, I didn't take time to just breathe and, and, and relax and enjoy the fact that you know some of the achievements that I did. Mm. 
That's a really good point to uh, to share with us. You talk quite a bit about being happy in your skin. When when did you get to the stage in your career where you felt really happy within your skin, both as a human being and as an athlete? Um, I don't know. Um, like I was always like, um, even even as a youngster, I was never a supported person. Um, it was like. Like, I always got sick for running. Like, so the teachers would be on my back saying, the brains are in your feet, you'll never achieve anything. My friends would be bullying me because I was doing something that was so alien. Um, you know, I'd get told when I was successful that I wouldn't be successful because of my accent. Um, you know, so I've always, always, always had to prove myself to be better than what I really needed to be. And I think um, because I've always had to do that even now and and later in life when I've achieved all I can and whatever um, I don't think that you're ever truly happy in your skin because I always feel that um, that I've always got to go beyond the college to, to prove myself and and it's and it's been embedded in me since I was like a kid you know um, and you know the stigma that we got because of you know how we were brought up and where we were brought up and and, and what we've done throughout our life, um, it's always been an issue. So, you know, I think that you learn to accept who you are and adapt who you are to the surroundings that you're in. Um, but happy in my own skin, I don't ever think I'd ever probably be happy in my own skin. You know, I'm I'm proud of who I am. You know, I'm, I'm proud of my achievements. Um, and you know, I try to be the best person I can be. And if some people like that, great. If some people hate that, then that's their choice. You know, I, I'm I'm past. I, I'm definitely past the point where I care what people think about me anymore. You know, mm. I, I don't. You know, I I'm very happy in the fact that um, I make the right choices. And if I make the right choices, then I can't persona of what other people think. Are you celebrating the small wins these days? Um, you know what? I celebrate the wins of the people that I'm involved with and I celebrate them more than I would with myself because I get great enjoyment and satisfaction in helping other like-minded people. Mm, okay. Now, You've inspired a generation of runners, but you're also inspiring people still today. And there's probably going to be young people watching this particular show that are inspired by your achievements over the years. One of the things that I think is really important that you did in your career was having a plan B. And one of the things that you did was to invest in property. So can you tell us the mindset you had back then in terms of making sure that you had a plan B? Yeah, I think... uh from a very early age, I always knew that, you know, um, I mean, I didn't think I would be ever make a living out of being an athlete when I was young, but um, I was always a type of person that was very thrifty, like, you know, um, as a child, I'd go to the, the, the berries and I'd be picking berries and I'd never spend money. I'd save, 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 save to the point that my brothers used to come and borrow money from me and I would charge them to pay me back. <laughs> My my sister my sister did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, quite thrifty with things, um, and so you know I, I was I was never sort of like blasted in the fact that when I started earning that you know um, because I was earning from the sport I was always very aware that you know anything could happen and it could be taken away from you so you know you're better to prepare um, for what happens when that happens and so from a very very young age um you know i you know i invested in lots of in the you know um policies and pensions and you know everything like that there and i was advised really well as well but um i was just very um i always say that you know you, you don't put all your eggs in one basket and you you need to look at the reality of what life is and, and you know sport is is not just the only life that's out there and it can be cruelly stopped in the matter of like you know you can get such a bad injury you can you know trip down the stairs you can 
you, you know, there's lots of different things that you can, that can happen to you, um, and you'll never, you know, be able to reach the heights that you did before. So I was always very prepared for that, um, knowing that you know it could be taken away from me at any time, and um, and uh, you know I've, I've tried to sort of uh, sort of say that to people that I'm involved in as well. You know, don't get too embroiled in it that this is all you've got in life. Because um, you know, it might it's very, very difficult to be um, you know, a world class athlete. It's you could be a world class athlete and still not earn a good living. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a, as sunny as what a lot of people think and um so you you've got to have, you know, education. Uh, if it's not education then, you know, you've got to make a a pathway that's away from your athletics as well so that just to ensure that you know your lifestyle isn't just crushed because mm. you can't run mm. do you think that the commercialism of sports over the years has taken away that uh, that real core root passion that you talk about in terms of you know doing sport for the love of it rather than doing it for the financial gain do you think that's been changed by the commercialism of it over the years um as I say, it's really, really difficult to make a living out of being a professional athlete. You know, um, y- there's so many different disciplines in the sport that, you know, um, like y- you'll get the odd superstars, but they're very far and few between. Um, I think in nowadays, like you've got your Instagrams and all your social medias that, you know, you've got a lot of not world-class athletes being <laughs> making a very, very good living out of... Um, promoting themselves so we're in a totally different lifestyle now of like whole demeanor of you know what it is to be an athlete you know it's more about being an influencer now nowadays yeah, yeah. that's that's a dramatic change in them um, and in, in what like you know what we what what my era was um you know yeah you, you did actually have to be really good at what you did to actually <laughs> yeah. qualified as well uh, you know, you don't seem to need that anymore. You just need to be able to be able to run 5K and then you can advise everybody. But, um, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just, it's a big open market now, isn't it? Uh, and the world has changed. And, you know, the youngsters that are coming through and whatever, they have to change with that or they get left behind because it is a social media frenzy now. Um, but, you know, it is a different ball game altogether. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't, um, you can even compare um, like for like nowadays. So, you know, let's let's play devil's advocate here. If if you were starting off again now, and, and the ironic thing here is that your daughter is carving her own career in the athletics world, and uh, she would have been off to Tokyo this year if we had Olympic Games. And uh, h- how do you see it? Would you love to be in the social media frenzy world that we have today, or would you prefer to just carry on the career that you had back in the day? Uh, I, I'm still a bit old school, I'm, I? I really do, you know, I, I really do believe that people need to have a bit of qualifications and experience to advise people. Um, mm. You know, mm. it, it's great to look good and, you know, um, wear things well and, you know, post really fun things. But, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of inexperienced advice out there. And whether it's the best advice, I don't particularly agree with. But, um, you know, I, I'm just a bit, you know, I, I, I sometimes worry about um, just the masses of misinformation that's out there. Mm. Um, you know, you, you know, if you want to answer anything, you just YouTube it now, don't you? Whether it's mm. right, wrong, or whatever, you know, and you don't go, to, you don't, you know, you, you don't really go to see you know it's like the other day someone in the uh, facebook was like i've got this pain here here and here and you had about 125 people telling them what it was <laughs> and, <I'm> <laughs> and it's like no you know that's wrong <laughs> go to you doctor <laughs> get started, you know what i mean but you know that's that's the sort of world that you're in now and um you know it, it, it's it's uh it could be a bit of a a shocker like a bit of a scary uh sort of uh, just misinformation out there and so you know I, I'm uh, I'm very happy that I'm not particularly involved in it to be yeah. honest okay I, I, I get it I get it 
Now, I've, I could pull out so many highlights of your running career, but I've, I've focused on three races that I just want to talk to you about because there's, there's three different things that happen in these races that are kind of stuck with me over the years. And, and now that I've finally got a chance to actually talk to you, I can ask you about them. So let's talk about, first of all, 1991, the World Championship 10,000 metre final. Um, you had an absolutely, you, you were on song that day. There's no doubt about it. But there was one part of the race that, I've watched this, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 times. You were about 380 metres out from the finish line. You were just starting the last lap and you almost stumbled over the inside curb of the track. What what recollection do you have of that? And um, was there a thought in, in your mind at the time that you could have fallen over? No, none whatsoever. I can't even remember it. Um, I think I was just so knackered. Like, you know, honestly, I was spent on my feet, to be honest. <laughs> right. And I think it, you know, I, what I think what happened was I have no memory of it, but I think what happened was I was trying to pick it up, and you know the legs were were going. Yeah. Um, I think that that's that's the only sort of explanation I can give. I have no memory of it at all. Right. Well, I'm glad um, that you didn't fall over and that you did go on to to finish it. All of it, but I think what I was trying to do is like you know obviously it's the last lap and you're you're trying to overreach then, aren't you? You know, and, and you're sort of, this is the last lap, and trying to pick it up, and I think I must have just sort of stumbled, or I don't know, I honestly don't know, but I cannot remember it at all. Were you trying to pick it up because of a potential threat, because there was no one within Kui of you, or was it just your own pride and determination to go for a fast last lap? It's just the way you're in bread, isn't it? It's just like, last lap, you pick it up, and that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, good answer. Now, next one is um, same year, 1991, New York City, the marathon. And um, I just I want you to explain because none of us really get to have this sensation. And if I remember right, you had the, the running bib number F6 on your chest that day. And you turned into Central Park. You were in the lead and you went on to win the New York City Marathon. How was that feeling when you turned into Central Park and you more or less knew that you had it in the bag? Um, to be honest, like the, I'd never planned on doing New York that year. Um, I'd won the world title, and about, I think it was about 10 days after I won the world title or something, Fred LeBeau called me, he was the guy that was organizing the New York Marathon, and he said that um, there'd been a press conference with um, Rosa Mota and, uh, uh, Ondaniki, the Australian um, girl Lisa. who were like Lisa yeah, Ondaniki. Mm. They were they were like the one and two or something in the world that year or whatever, and they were doing the New York Marathon. And the question that was asked was, a young Scottish girl had just won the ten thousand meters. Would she run a good marathon? And they both turned around and said no. Um, <laughs> energy because I was a track runner. So Fred called me and he says, "Do you want to prove them wrong?" And without even thinking, I just says, yeah, okay. And I says, when? <laughs> like, like, six time or something. And I was like, oh, jeez. But I'd always been a, you know, even for the 10K, I'd always ran, you know, 100, 105 miles a week. So, you know, I had no, my longest run, mind you, would only have been um, sort of 12 miles. Um, so I had the longer runs, but I'd done a lot of miles within my training. Yeah. And um, I just thought to myself, yeah, I'll be able to do it. And, so for six weeks, I went and I did um, two 16-mile runs and an 18-mile run. Yeah. And I did a lot longer, like, fat and work. So, you yep. know, I'd do, like, 12-mile fat leg or something like that. And um, and I went into the, the race, and I felt so easy right from the go that I knew from, like, less than halfway, I, it was mine. Wow. I knew wow. the whole way. Wow. I knew the whole way. I knew I was listening to the girls running and I was just bouncing along. It was just really a matter of like, when do I want to go? And I wasn't going to, I was going to leave it until I was getting to Centre Park, but the pace was really slow for me. And I just thought, you know, I feel really good. So I'm just, so when we went out of Brooklyn, when we came out of Brooklyn, you go up the sort of hill into the park, I just thought, I feel really good. And I just started naturally just striding out and, you know, obviously left Lisa. And then um, I just felt really, really strong. And, it was it was just a, it, it was a, a good feeling because again you know and it goes back to everybody always doubting me mm. Mm. to be able to come out on top on a race that I'd never ever ran before and had no intentions of running I just felt I had a point to prove you know why be so disrespectful 
to someone by saying something like that, you know, and, yeah. I, and I, yeah. it really riled me again. So for me personally, it was the fact that, you know, um, I executed a really, really good race um, with very little training and um, it was just an amazing experience, um, you know, to run that last sort of couple of miles on my own and, um, you know, experience like the, the sort of the buzz in New York, really. Um, yeah. So it was a pretty uh, amazing experience, to be honest. So do you think without that phone call from Fred Lebeau that you would have stepped up to the marathon at some stage? I would have stepped up, but a lot later. Right. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Several years. I, I wouldn't have. And I think, like... To be honest, it was like um, a bit. It kind of like because I because I was so successful in New York, it kind of then pushed that forward far too quick, you know. And right. it was kind of like you know because I won that, then New York, uh, London, then signed me at like a five-year deal that I had to run London, and then it was kind of like that was me a marathon runner. And it, you know, I really didn't plan on doing that. I'd actually planned on doing another few years, like. You know, I wanted to run faster over the 10k. Yeah. Um, to you know, sort of, you know, win an Olympic medal at the 10k. Then you know, I got the silver, and I was preferably wanted the gold, but mm. um, never got that sort of opportunity again because the, you know, when 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 the marathon happened, it was like just this whole um sort of big push from management and things to see. Oh well, you know, like you know, you need to do the marathon now. That's where it's at, and da, 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 you know, that sort of thing. So. Um, so that's kind of how it happened. Let's talk about the Olympics because you you got a silver medal, which is outstanding, of course. And um, having never won a silver medal in the Olympic Games myself, it's a question mark of um, one never knows how disappointed you are in not getting the gold. But with what we've seen over the last years and decades, with the question marks over some of those results over those distances, um, are you somebody that's feeling a little bit regretful about being beaten by somebody that could potentially have a question mark? Um, you know what? In my head, that was settled on the day that it happened. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's nothing new. It's what I knew. Hmm. Um, it's what everybody else in the race knew. So, you know, to come 20, 30 years later and say the same thing, it's nothing, the information is not new. Um, you know, we knew that we were running against girls that, you know, were, whether it was government aided or whatever, they were, they were definitely taking drugs and whatever. And um, you just had to deal with that, you know. Um, for me, I was, when I got my silver, it kind of nearly ended my whole athletic career because I went into a bit of a, like a depression of it I thought like you know um, I did everything right in that race and you know she was still within that striking distance just to get me and it was kind of like you know what do you what, what can I, what got me was like I saw them training in Gainesville and I saw what they were doing and I knew that it wasn't on the same caliber as what they actually competed at the Olympics um, you know they were totally different athletes from the month that I saw them in Gainesville um, and you sit there and you say to yourself, well, you know, what can I do? You know, there's nothing else I can do to win. There's nothing. Because I tried, you know, I, I trained really hard and thought I had prepared the best that I could and whatever. And, um, you know, and, and it was very disheartening. And I thought, you know, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be able to win it. So I actually went in a bit of like a, a sort of like a depression about it and um, decided to retire in 88. And then I decided that, um, you know, I'm going to retire and just try for a baby because, you know, I'd, I'd sort of like had a pretty successful career up till then. And um, so we actually did. Um, so I actually stopped running or whatever and we tried to have a baby, but I, for whatever reason, couldn't get pregnant or whatever. And um, I remember sitting just at the back end of eight, eight just before the Commonwealth games in New Zealand um, there was a big interview on the TV about Jill Hunter who was an English girl who was kind of a rival of mine uh, but a friend as well and um, and the, the interview was how she was favourite to win the medal at the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand and yeah, I was sitting talking to my husband Peter Town and I was saying well um, I think I could win that and he was like well if you think you won it, why are you sitting there? Why don't you just go on and do it? So, <laughs> I, 
sort of after sort of like sort of six months of sort of like having a break and like not getting pregnant or whatever, I just decided, well, do you know what? I think I could do it. So I went and trained for twelve weeks. You're right. And I ended up winning. <laughs> I wasn't. I, honest, I wasn't in the best shape um, for the the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. So I was very fortunate to win. Hmm. Um, but um, I did end up winning it. Um, and lo and behold, when I won it and I came back, um, I ended up getting pregnant and not knowing I was pregnant. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, why well, does that happen? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe best of trying to get pregnant. I don't know. But anyway, um, I ended up getting pregnant when we came back, and then that was when Ailish, um was born in, in the, just at the 1990s then. Right. Just after come. Yeah. So just just going back to the Olympics and that that you know that feeling that emotion that you had and and obviously it affected you in that way. Was there anger towards the the sports authorities, the federations, the the, the doping agencies, and all of that? Was there some kind of um, frustration you had about their either closed eyes or or lack of resources to be able to stop this? There 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 was, but you know there, it was like um, you know we all knew that. The girls who were racing against were, you know, taking drugs. You, you could blatantly see it, you know, um, just in their whole demeanour. You could see that, you know, certain ones were, were, were taking drugs. And at the time, you know, there was just nothing you could do about it. You know, you could say all you want about it, but it was just like nothing could be done. Mm. Um, and it was just accepted like because at the end of the day um you just wouldn't get a bed in the morning if that was your attitude so i i firmly believed that i could beat them whether they were drugs or not i i honestly believed that i could and i think that that was the realization in 88 when i got beat and got beat you know so closely like you know last 200 meters it it was kind of like geez what the heck do i need to do you know how can you know how can i do it and and that that was sort of the first time I ever really questioned it, because up until that point I also honestly thought, yeah, like you know, they could be taking drugs or whatever, but I think I I can still beat them at it, and that was the realization that I couldn't. Mm. It was mm. a big thing for me that yeah. changed my whole sort of mindset. But then, um, I then you know after I sort of got my medal at the Commonwealth Games, it kind of just rekindled a lot of the love of why I ran and what I wanted out of it for myself and then that's why I kind of got back into it and then I started to just do what was right for me again and not worry about you know the way I used to you know the way I sort of used to be it was just like you know I've just got to run as fast as I can and not worry about anybody else and hopefully it's that fast and nobody can stay with me and that's what happened in Tokyo. Yeah right fantastic Let's talk about the Commonwealth Games because that was my third race that I pulled out of your uh, portfolio that really uh, emotionally got to me because it was in front of your home crowd in Scotland and it was a a magnificent occasion because you talk about it being one of the most special experiences that you ever had in your career in terms of just the way the crowd was and the support and love that they showed you uh, during that 10,000 metres. Talk us through that race. Yeah, um Again, like you know, I'd been in the states for um, sort of three years, and um, so not a lot of people kind of knew of me or remembered me, if you know what I mean. So because I'd been away for quite a while, and um, I so I wasn't favourite or anything for the, when the race or whatever. And I just remember like when we got picked for Commonwealth Games, I thought, oh, geez, it's in Scotland, I'm not, it's not even going to feel like a championship, but it's just down the road for me. <laughs> and, yeah. disappointed when I first heard it was Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh because I was like, oh, you know, you're that used to travelling away all the time um, and, and it's the sort of buzz of travelling and, you know, getting to the country and then settling in and whatever that it kind of, I, I, I thought in my head, oh, it would just be like running on my home track and it wasn't until, like, we, the whole Scottish team was standing outside um, to get introduced, you know, for the opening ceremony and, like, the whole team was outside Medibank Stadium and uh, the bagpipes started to play and we all started marching in and the, just the roar of the crowd as we went in, like your hair just stood up on the back of your neck and you were just like, oh, you know, flipping heck, like this is this is massive. This is not what I thought it was going to be. And it really, really made me nervous because I'd never experienced that before. 
Right. So we were staying in the halls of residence um, at Heriot Watt, and um, obviously there was a, a lot of like um, negativity about the the games because uh, the funding and everything had been like we didn't know what was going to head and all this sort of stuff. And so there was a lot of negativity about the games even actually being held. And so when they started, it was great, and um, there was a lot of pressure on to get the gold medals because that's a successful games at the end of the day is how many medals you get as a team and um, unfortunately for Scotland the athletics weren't doing good at all and um, I remember sort of like it was Tom McKean, Yvonne Murray and myself and we were like the, the, the last three white hopes of like getting this gold medal and um, Tom, Tom went and ran and you know he didn't really do it and then um, I remember sitting with Yvonne just before she she went to run. And she was like really up for running well and um, all that sort of stuff. And she left, and and then as she was coming back, I had to leave. And obviously Yvonne didn't run well either. And um, as she came back, I was trying to avoid her coming back because I didn't want a, any negativity from you know seeing anybody else that's lost the medal that didn't want it and all this stuff. And then I remember leaving, and as I left the halls of residence, the a uh, Scottish team manager turned to me and says, oh, well, Liz, you're our last hope. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, no. It was like getting thrown into the lines then, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. oh, my days, that's the last thing I needed to hear here as I was going to my race. But, you know, it was an amazing, amazing perform, uh, uh, amazing to perform in front of a crowd that is like, you know, your home crowd. Yeah. And um, I just remember, like, you know, the race, it, it it was pouring the rain and so some people had left and most of the people had stayed but you know it was a terrible night it wasn't the best weather and I remember sort of as the race was going on and obviously everybody's deflated because you know we haven't won a medal and this is the last race of the track and field yeah. there's no more after me yeah so you know and, and you can sort of feel you know there was a, a little lull in the stadium you know it wasn't a great atmosphere everybody was dead quiet and obviously I'm running 25 laps <laughs> and you could just see like you know as it sort of as the laps were going by and you could sort of see everybody getting interested <laughs> because it's like <laughs> oh she's still there <laughs> she's still there and you could actually like as an athlete you could you know I could actually feel the buzz rising if you know what I mean right yeah yeah and yeah it got over from halfway you could just feel the tension coming and coming and and you know um it was very, very, very hard for me to contain myself because I felt that I wanted to go earlier because it was such a great atmosphere and they were just, it was just building and building and building and I felt fantastic. Yeah. And um, so when I went, just the roar in the place was just amazing. And you don't get that anywhere else. You know, I've, it was like the, the beginning of the end, really. You know, I never got that same atmosphere in any race that I ever ran again because it was such an enclosed sort of special night of the way it happened yeah. um, and you know my mum and my dad was there and they never came to see me race well my dad was there but he ran out of the stadium as I was running <laughs> right. <couldn't> walk, <laughs> which is like a little bit, but anyway um, but yeah. you know he came onto the track at the end when my uncle well lapped to go said she's winning and she's got a cat for you know, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um but yeah, so it was really special. Um, it was an amazing, amazing, amazing night. And I know that a lot of people say that the Commonwealth Games isn't a big event now anymore. And, um, you know, it's it's not the same as Olympics or whatever. But I do think it has a place because for me, um, it really catapulted me into a big belief of, you know, I like this and I want more of it. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. And, and it was a really, really special night for me. And I've I've also forgiven you for beating my fellow countryman Anne Aldane in that race, and uh, and Anne was a trailblazer for us in New Zealand because she was the, yeah. the the first one that stepped out, as you know, onto the road racing scene in the United yeah. States and paved the way for a lot of female athletes getting paid and and all the rest of it. And she copped a lot yeah. of flack about that back in New Zealand. I'm sure you know about that. And uh, she she was a yeah. trailblazer for us. It's an amazing story as well when you think her feet were the wrong way round and she had the operation and you know even to amazing to think that she was able to run um, anything like yet alone win major championships and that but um, still friends with Anna actually I talked to her a lot on Facebook and I think that she's um, she definitely was a, an understated uh, strong woman that yeah. led especially in the states you know early so early eighties like uh, she was the one that kind of made sponsors up and actually pay women to run mm. 
this. Uh, you know the way you get in all this debate about should women tennis players get the same as men tennis players? But, you know, Anne, Anne was one of the first ones that actually set that whole ball in motion on the racing circuit in the States. Um, so, yeah, she's a very, very strong and influential woman. She did a very, very... Um, it was important what she did back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, thank you for saying that because um, I feel as a New Zealander that she has never really gained the respect that she deserves in our country um, for for the things that she she did. And there's a fantastic documentary online about her journey actually in life. I don't know whether you've seen that, but it's a a brilliant documentary that kind of you know showcases the path that she she did for a lot of female athletes around the world so yeah that's great now just before we end up today i've got a couple of things i've got to ask you what what was the toughest athletic experience you had in your life in your career and and not necessarily in a race was there something else that came up that was really extremely challenging for you um i think really like the, the, the challenging part for me was like when i was young and trying to you know, it was very, very difficult, my background and being a woman and, like, where I lived to actually do what I wanted to do and and for it to be accepted in what I was doing. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, if I'd done it, like, 10 years later, it would have been so much different and I would have got a lot of support for it to try and help me be better but um i just think that it, you know I, I think it's a lot of really good talent can be overlooked just because you don't look a certain way and mm. i think that for me it would have been good to get a little bit more support as a child um and not so much negativity about you know what i look like or uh who i was or and you know i even to this day you know like um, I'll go into a school and, you know, I'll go into sort of try and recruit some athletes and, you know, they always bring the, the tall skinny ones to me and I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's me, you know, I, I wasn't like that as a child and, you know, and I just think that, you know, a lot of people make a presumption of, you know, what hard work can change in a person and I think that, um, you know, just to be given, I think it would have been great to be given like um, a bit more support and the opportunities that I needed when I was younger yeah. to be honest okay really good point so what's your advice to young people that are starting out today who have this ambition to be a professional it doesn't matter whether it be a runner or athlete in general what's your advice for them starting out today my advice to anyone um, it's not about being a professional it's about finding something that you enjoy doing and it doesn't matter whether you're good at it but if you enjoy doing it and you get something out of it, then stick with it because consistency is key. Like if you do, you know, it's like, um, you know, endurance runners aren't born, we're made. You know, we have to we have to take the grind. We have to work hard. And if you commit to, you know, choosing a path and staying on that path and just, you know, believing and enjoying what you do, then the opportunities are that you'll be successful at it. Mm, yeah, great advice. Let's talk about the other end of your career because I, I see and I read a lot about um, athletes when they retire from the top of the sport, they, they fall into a lot of trouble. A lot of them can't adjust to life after sport. Do you think there's enough support mechanisms in place for athletes when they retire? I think that um, a lot of a lot of athletes, do like they, they um, struggle with the normality of life without sport. Um, you know, when you're used to travelling and having teammates and, the, you know, and, and the buzz of it being just about you and suddenly it's not there anymore, it is really, really difficult to take. And I think that, you know, as organisations of sport, like, you know, whether it's athletics or cycling or football, I think you have um, a duty of care to actually provide some form of... Um, not even a get out clause, but you know, like a slow down clause of what it is to be without that and to accept that. And you know, because it's like sometimes it's like for me, and for instance, like I wasn't ready to retire and um, I uh, got an injury 
And I was told, oh, if you go in and get an operation six weeks later, I'll be healed and be back running, which at the time you think, oh, six weeks is nothing, I'll go and do that. So 15 operations later, three years of trying to get back, I didn't get back. And like for three years, I constantly thought, I'm going to get back, I'm going to get back, I'm going to get back, but I never got back. Yeah. And so, you know, when that happens to you mentally, you know, your, your head's still in the space of being the athlete and living the, as the athlete, but the body's letting you down. And there's no there's no connection, you know, to the fact that you know this isn't going to happen anymore. You just live in this athletic head of yours that mm. I'll get back, I'll get back, I'll get back. And mm. you know, and you go through depression and you go through a lot of lot of difficult times. And you know, there's there's there was nowhere for me to get advice on how I was feeling or how to relate to not being able to run anymore or to compete anymore and um, I think you know luckily for me I'm, I've always been involved in coaching even before I retired I was coaching and for me that was my saving grace because I was then able to put although I wasn't able to physically do it I can then put input into other people doing it and that's enough for me and yeah. I get a lot of out of that but a lot of people don't have that so you know there has to be a duty of care or you know, or, or somewhere that someone can go to to ask advice and yeah. to get a, a bit of direction. Yeah. And like whether it's like you know, um, like pathways where ex athletes can get involved in kit coaching kids or going to your local clubs or passing advice on to others. You know, there's a lot of involvement that we can still get involved in, other than just what our sport was about hmm. being yourself. If you know what I mean. And ironically for you, if I remember right, that was you hadn't been injured throughout your career until that stage, had you? You were basically injury free. Good, yeah, I was pretty good. Like honestly, like for the amount of miles that I did as an athlete, but I did really, you know, I I did take really good care of myself with like you know therapy and stretching, and you know I I really did. Uh, I was very up on all that, and um, so I was quite robust. But unfortunately for me. Um, I had arthritis, which was, funnily enough, my sister, who's never run in her life, had the exact same problem. Got the exact same operation, and she was fine, and I wasn't. Oh. So it's like, that <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, so I, I had arthritis in my feet that I and that I ignored for many many a year, and I called and um, I caused an ulcer in my bone, so the bone was rotted in my foot, and um, it then caused a lot of issues. Um, so you know, for me, I was unfortunate that I didn't get back, but um. You know, I think that it would have been great if I could had like some kind of um, way to talk through things, yeah. Rather than being left on my own and like, oh, you're never going to run again. You know, that 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 was the way it was. It was just like, you know, you were just cut off completely, which yeah. is really really difficult. So yeah, I think there is a duty of care for um, sport and governed bodies to actually have things in place. But I do see, I do see a, a bit of like. Um, um, sports therapy um, sort of psychologists and things like that coming into the sport which I think is a really good thing yeah. um, but I always think you know there's enough there's enough um, there's not enough ex-athletes that go into the development of the sport and you know it, it's always good to give back a little um, and I think that you know it would be great to see more people you know getting involved more at grassroots level things like that why do you think that doesn't happen? Is it is it a case of funding? Is it purely come down to that? Where we're, we're not getting enough, you know, ex not only Olympians and world champions, but people that have had a professional career in sport are unable to find these pathways back into giving back. What do you what do you think the hurdles are there? Um, maybe the fact that we don't encourage it an awful lot. Um, and again, um, I think that you know, I, I suppose it's individual as well. Like you know, I mean, I was coaching before I actually stopped running, so I always had that interest and hmm. um, whether some people um you know maybe have given enough to the sport um but you know I, I i feel that a majority of people would actually like to get involved in some way um and again it, it's just making people aware of what's available for them to get involved um i don't think it's like probably publicized as much as what it can be that there are areas that you can get involved in um you know it doesn't have to be a professional six day a week it could be a one day a week it could be you know whatever way you want to work with it but i do think that knowledge is the the, the sort of fountain of everything i mean a, a prime example is um one of the best well one of the best um uk coaches that i've kind of known um died this week a guy called george gandhi and you know his whole knowledge is born with him 
you know, and it's like, you know, why hasn't somebody sat down with this guy yep. and got his own course of training because he's coached Olympian after Olympian after Olympian. Yep. You know, he was head of AA coaching. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a shame now that, you know, that fountain of knowledge has gone. And it's like, you know, we should be picking up on all that sort of stuff. And there's lots of people that have been successful in the sport that we should be picking knowledge up on. And, you know, because that, that knowledge makes the future for the, you know, the future athletes to be better. Um, and, you know, we don't seem to sort of tap into that in Britain. I don't know. I don't know why. But, um, yeah. you know, I'd like to see more of that where, you know, you did you do have, like, all these experienced coaches sitting down and giving your, their ethos on training and documenting how they've did certain things, you know. Yeah. Might not, you know, not everybody's cup of tea. You might not agree with, but... You know, if they've had success, it's always good to know, you know, well, how did they have success and, you know, what was the thought process of their training and, and what they delivered, you know? Sounds absolutely solid to me. Got a quick, a uh, couple of quick ones before we go, Liz. And the first one is last week in Valencia, we saw a couple of amazing world records, one in the ladies' 5,000 metres and one in the men's 10,000. What's your take on those two world records in particular? Yeah, it was a bit. Um, I was surprised that um, like Giddy hasn't run. Like, I mean, she's not our best five um, k runner. She's been beaten quite a lot this year, so it was quite interesting to see her run so quick. Um, shoes have a lot to do with it, and we can go on the shoe debate all you want. Like, but you know, the shoes and technology has made a massive input into how fast people are running now. But we're here, oh, we're here, we're in the the year of technology, and we have to. Um, you know, might not agree with it, but you know, it's where we're at with it now. Um, it's just unfortunate that one company's got the, you know, so advanced. But um, hopefully, over the next couple of years, um, a lot of other brands will catch up. Um, even if it's just halfway, at least it's a catch up of some sort. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's a, you know, I, do I get excited about it anymore? No, I don't. Um, but we are in a different era of running. Mm. And on, um, you know, I, now you're looking at the girls that sub 14, which will be interesting. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's the advance, advancement of the sport. Mm. So I, I wanted to ask you about the shoe technology because it is such a, it is such a, having such a huge impact. And for for the purists like you and I, as I dare say that, um, it, it's got such a question mark over it. Can we can we move forward in the world of athletics and, and really feel comfortable with these world records being slashed like they are? Yeah, well, do you know, I'm, I'm all for technology, you know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, moving sports forward, but I'm, you know, I'm all for a clean sport and I'm not for aiding performance, which is what drugs do. And so shoe technology is actually aiding performance now, and that's the world that we're in. And, you know, I'm not a, a super fan of that, you know, because it is aiding. Um, but what I will say is, um, as I said earlier, we are in the age of new technology, but the only thing that I would like to see is that because we have this new technology, I believe that every athlete should have the... Um, the ability or the choice to run in that same shoe. It doesn't matter whether it's Nike, Asics, Saucony, New Balance. The technology in that shoe that everybody races in should be the same. Hmm. Yeah. There should be no advanced shoe technology for one brand to the other because like a lot of people say to me, oh, but you know what, we used to run in Cinder Tracks and now we're running on Mondo, but everybody's running on the same surface in that race. Yeah. But not... Yeah same shoe technology and yeah. that's the difference the shoes are aiding at the end of you can you know talk about technology to your blue in the face the shoes that nike are producing at this moment in time are aiding the athletes the mm. others although they're trying to catch up are not there yet mm. so for me i think it's an unfair advantage and i'm all for technology but i believe that everybody should have the same opportunity to run in the same technology so that it's an even playing field and that's, that's, all, that's all I say about it you know I'm not I'm not complaining in the fact that they're running quicker than the world records because you know advancement happens you know we're in 2020 now so we're, you know you're going to get advancement in the world records time so I'm not you know I'm not upset about that or whatever 
But what I do firmly believe is that it is an, a disadvantage if you are not a Nike athlete at the moment. Yeah. Liz, my last question for today is simply this. What was your greatest moment in your career as an athlete? Oof. I suppose you would need to say, like, I'll, uh, I've got several greatest moments for different things because, like, um, I was very time-orientated. So when I got the world record, it meant a lot to me because I was a very time-orientated athlete. But to be able to say that you're, you know, the best in the world at any one moment in time kind of outweighs a lot of other performances. So I think that, you know, when I was world champion, um, it was a really, really special moment for me to be able to say, you know, at that one moment in time, you know, there was no other woman in the world that was better than me. And mm. so I would, I would sort of, I would have to say that that's probably the crowning moment. Okay. But for me personally, like, you know, when I ran world records, and, and that was the, a buzz for me because I knew that nobody had ever ran faster than me before, which was very, very important to me. Yeah, understandably so. Well, listen, on behalf of millions of people around the world, I want to thank you so much for your incredible career and also for what you're doing today because you're giving back and you're making a difference to younger people coming through and that's something to be very, very proud of as well. So thank you very much for being on the show today, Liz. It's been a pleasure and thanks for having me.